question is, am I being charged with something? Chaos and confusion captured on a body camera. New video released tonight shows the moment after the deadly onset shooting during the filming of the movie Rust and a police interview with star Alec Baldwin. Breaking tonight, a major border ruling from a federal judge who paused the Biden administration's rollback of Title 42. What happens next? We have Maria Elena Salinas standing by. Former President Donald Trump held in civil contempt. A court ruling the former president did not comply with the subpoena to turn over evidence. Now, ABC News has obtained more than 2,300 text messages from his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, before, during, and after the January 6th riot that shed light on the frantic moments when members of Trump's inner circle realized the gravity of the violence at the Capitol. West Virginia became ground zero for the opioid crisis and has fallen victim again, this time by the fentanyl crisis. In the latest installment of our Poisoned series, we speak to the doctor who inspired the lead character in the hit Hulu show, Dope Sick, about how addiction can hit anyone, anytime. I knew their addictive potential. What I didn't realize was, was how quickly it happened. A stay of execution granted for a mom on death row, but her 15-year flurry of appeals isn't over yet. What's next for Melissa Lucio, convicted of killing her two-year-old daughter as she fights for freedom, her family by her side? Do you believe that your mom killed Mariah? Not at all, man. My mother, I don't even think she'll kill a fly. $44 billion, and Elon Musk has flown away with Twitter. The billionaire closes a blockbuster deal to buy the social media giant. The major changes already in store. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We're tracking several major stories on this busy Monday night, including a court ruling with massive implications at the border, the high stakes visit by top US officials to Kyiv, and the richest man in the world moving to buy Twitter. But we begin tonight with dramatic new insight into that deadly shooting on the set of the movie Rust last October. You've probably seen this photo of a distraught Alec Baldwin in the moments after he shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins. But tonight, we're now getting a first look at those tense moments on camera and so much more. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office late today released all files from their ongoing investigation, including body camera video from the moments after that shooting. Baldwin was seen telling police, I was the one holding the gun. In a moment, you'll see what happens next. Authorities also released footage of Baldwin rehearsing for that scene, whipping out the revolver and pointing it toward the camera twice. Tonight, our team at ABC News is pouring through the hours and hours of footage and the trove of documents. Kaylee Hartung, who has covered this story for months, leads us off tonight with these late breaking developments. Tonight, inside Alec Baldwin's first interview with authorities just after that fatal shooting on the set of Rust. So my only question is, am I being charged with something? No, we're just... Yeah. Officers trying to piece together what happened as Baldwin rehearsed a scene in the Western. The Santa Fe Sheriff's Department releasing hours of video and hundreds of pages of documents. Everybody stops what they're doing right now. This is a crime scene. Six months into their investigation into cinematographer Helena Hutchins' death and the rush by paramedics to try to save her life and director Joel Souza's. Okay? One female shot in the chest, male shot in the stomach, requested air flight. Tonight, for the first time, behind the scenes as the chaos unfolded. You were you were in the room when the lady when someone I was, was the shot? holding the gun? Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, what do you need? Well, I, I know your name, so okay. it, it's it's. Uh, um, Let me call you back, okay? Let me get with my lieutenant and see, see where we want right, you to where we want you to hang out, okay? Armor Hannah Gutierrez Reed in tears, okay. handing authorities the box of supposed dummy rounds she pulled from to load the gun. This is the one. I'm pretty sure. I'm, this is a, that's the one. And I. Okay. Sorry. You're okay. Sorry. Just relax. Just relax. I'm so scared. I'm sorry. You're all right. Just relax. <laughs> so here's the box that I got them out of. Okay. Leave them right there. Leave them right there. Okay. Telling investigators she checked all the rounds before loading. Is she okay? Can I don't, somebody I don't, tell me I, anything? I don't know anything. I just, right now, I don't know. I'm just trying to secure everything. We've done this for two weeks and we did it the right way every day. And Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, where do we go from here? Will there be any criminal charges? 
Well, so, Steph, we are still in the middle of an incomplete investigation. The sheriff saying that they are still lacking some key pieces of evidence, including the FBI's firearm and ballistics analysis. So we're still likely months away from any possible criminal charges here. Steph. This investigation going on for much longer. We know you'll stay on top of it. Thank you so much, Kaylee. A federal judge announced a pause on the Biden administration's rollback of Title 42. This decision, a result of a lawsuit filed by the states of Missouri, Louisiana, and Arizona. So here's a quick reminder as to what Title 42 is. Title 42 is a clause of the 1944 Public Health Services Law that allows the government to prevent the introduction of individuals during certain public health emergencies. Joining us now to break down what this decision means is ABC News contributor Maria Elena Salinas. Maria Elena, thank you so much for joining us. What does this judge's decision mean for the ongoing crisis at our border? Well, Stephanie, you know, as you said, this was this is only temporary. It's a temporary restraining order. So now I think we have to wait and see how the administration will react or how the CDC will react. So just like you said before, you know, we need to remember that Title 42 is a health measure and that it was used, and some might say that it was abused by the Trump administration to prevent asylum seekers from applying at the border. So the issue of lifting Title 42 really has been seen through a political lens on both parties. So it was effective in keeping asylum seekers from applying at the border and waiting their turn, but it wasn't effective in keeping undocumented immigrants from crossing the border. They will cross when they can, and they have been doing that for not years, decades, with or without Title 42. So, you know, we really should not be treating asylum seekers as if they were undocumented immigrants because they do have the legal right to request asylum and the U.S. does have the legal obligation to at least listen to their cases. Right. And Maria Elena, today a Republican delegation visited our nation's southern border and it coincided with the tragic news of a Texas National Guard soldier who was found dead. What do we know about this guardsman and how did some of the members of Congress react to his death? That's right. Uh, it was a specialist, uh, Bishop Evans, and he disappeared a few days ago. Uh, he, apparently, he was tr had uh, gone into the river trying to save someone, someone who was crossing the river, and he noticed that the person was in danger. And even though the immigrants that he was trying to save did make it out alive, he didn't. He disappeared, and, and his body was found today. Now, several members of Congress, like you said, did go to the border today, and they happened to tie the drowning of specialist Evans to the lifting of, of, of Title 42, which really should not be connected, or at least to President Biden's immigration policies. Uh, McCarthy claimed that there were reports that the person that he was trying to rescue on the river was carrying drugs. Uh, it, it really surprised me to hear that because it would be hard to believe since drugs usually come into the country, hidden in vehicles through legal border crossings or through tunnels or sometimes boats, sometimes planes, but not by someone trying to swim over to the U.S. because we really doubt that very powerful wealthy cartels would risk sending their product with a guy carrying it as he tried to swim across. But it definitely was able to be used by uh, a lot of members of, of, the, of, of Congress, Republican members of Congress, saying that because of these immigrants and trying to carry drugs over, uh, Specialist Bishop Evans died. He risked, uh, he risked his life. It's not the first time that you see border agents trying to save migrants when they cross the border. Uh, unfortunately, this time it ended up with a death, but it happens very often. They risk their lives either crossing by foot or by the, the river. And, and this was the result. The result was a, a tragedy for, for Specialist Evans, but it re really is a far reach trying to link it to President Biden's immigration policies, which are not really clear because up to this point, he has really uh, tried to keep most of uh, former President Trump's policies. Our thoughts are certainly with uh, Specialist Evans and his, his family. Maria Elena Salinas, thank you so much. Next tonight, Elon Musk closing a blockbuster deal to buy Twitter, the world's richest man buying the social media giant for about $44 billion. Major changes already expected. Musk repeatedly saying he sees Twitter as a platform for free speech. Many already asking, will anything happen to former President Trump's suspended account? Ariel Reshef reports. 
Tonight, the world's richest man in charge of Tesla and SpaceX is set to become a media mogul. Twitter announcing that Elon Musk has bought the social media giant for $44 billion, writing, upon completion of the transaction, Twitter will become a privately held company. The New York Times reporting Musk negotiated the details with Twitter's 11-member board overnight and into the early hours this morning. The deal means Twitter stockholders will get $54.20 for every share they own. So for a lot of shareholders, this is kind of a, a, a quick win. Uh, it's a very nice quick win. Simple. Musk announced his proposal in a tweet just 11 days ago, calling it his best and final offer. He's long been critical of how Twitter manages content on its platform, telling a TED conference his takeover mm. plan is about free speech. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. He's got well over 80 million users. He tweets a lot. He has been very public with some of his criticism about the platform. So. He's putting his money where his tweets are. He's buying the asset. Musk has talked about adding the ability to edit tweets and is promising to make Twitter's algorithm on how tweets get displayed public to build more trust. And he wants to eliminate spam, but he hasn't said whether he will allow banned users back on. That includes former President Trump, who told Fox News that even if he's reinstated, he intends to stay off the platform in favor of his own Truth Social. Stand by for some changes to Twitter, I'm sure. Ariel Russia for us, thanks so much. Now to the war in Ukraine. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin traveling to Kyiv, meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky. They offered new military assistance and diplomacy, but also strong words for Russia and a new threat of nuclear response. Marcus Moore reports from Kyiv. Tonight, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with a chilling warning. The risk of nuclear war is a real one. Speaking to state-run media, Lavrov said, quote, the danger is serious. It is real. It cannot be underestimated. He added that he did not want to see these risks of nuclear war, quote, artificially inflated. The warning came after a high-stakes visit by top American officials with Ukrainian President Zelensky in Kyiv. After the trip, U.S. Defense Secretary Austin was blunt in discussing U.S. goals. We want to see Russia uh, uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Russia has already failed in its original goals for the war and announced more assistance, including more than $322 million in new military aid for Ukraine. We do know that a sovereign, independent Ukraine will be around a lot longer than Vladimir Putin's on the scene. And today, President Biden said he would nominate veteran U.S. diplomat Bridget Brink to serve as the next U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Today, Russia unleashing new attacks on at least five railway stations and fuel sites across central and western Ukraine. But inside Russia, a massive fire engulfed a fuel depot in Bryansk, 60 miles from the border, seen in video circulating online. It is not clear how the inferno started. Outside the capital in Kyiv, some fear the Russians might return. The heaviest fighting has moved to the east, but amidst the devastation here in Irpin, locals tell me they are concerned that the Russians might try to come back to this city, but they say they're not afraid that they're ready to fight. I asked Ferdosi and Andre what they thought of Secretary Austin and Blinken's visit to Ukraine. Blinken and Austin приехали сюда в Украину. Что вы думаете? Both said they are grateful and that without support from the U.S., it would be hard for Ukraine to stand up against these monsters. And Marcus Moore joins us from the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv tonight. Marcus, Secretary Blinken today said the Russians had already failed to meet their original goals in the war. And tonight, we're getting a sense of the price Russian forces have already paid. Yeah, Stephanie, it has been a heavy price. The uh, British Defense Secretary believes that there are at least 15,000 um, Russian personnel who have been killed in the two months of this conflict. That is more than the losses from the U.S. during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. So it gives you a sense of just how much the Russians have lost in the midst of this war. Stephanie. Both Ukrainians and Russians suffering so much throughout all of this. Marcus Moore for us. Thank you so much. 
Tonight, we're getting the closest look yet at the conversations inside the Trump White House between Election Day and President Biden's inauguration. It's in more than 2,000 texts to and from former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. They include messages from Trump's family, White House and campaign officials, cabinet members, Republican Party leaders, and January 6th organizers. ABC's Chief White House correspondent, excuse me, ABC's Chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, has the details. One of the newly revealed text messages says that some of Donald Trump's staunchest allies in Congress wanted him to declare martial law to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. The text was sent from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, one of many text messages first reported by CNN that Meadows turned over to the January 6th committee. In our private chat with only members, Green wrote to Meadows, several are saying the only way to save our republic is for Trump to call for martial law. The text messages, which sources who have seen the material turned over to the January 6th committee, tells ABC News are authentic, include numerous texts from January 6th of Republicans close to Trump pleading with him to do something to stop the attack on the Capitol. Amidst the attack, even Marjorie Taylor Greene texted Meadows, quote, please tell the president to calm people. This isn't the way to solve anything. Former Trump chief of staff Reince Priebus texted in all caps, tell them to go home. And Donald Trump Jr. begged Meadows to push his father to make a statement, texting, this is one you go to the mattresses on. They will try to expletive his entire legacy on this if it gets worse. Text messages also show that some in Trump's inner circle were raising questions about his bogus claims that the election was stolen. Jared Kushner texted Meadows this fact check, showing that Trump's claims that election workers in Georgia had suitcases stuffed with ballots was a lie. And senior Trump campaign advisor Jason Miller sent Meadows a poll showing that 67% of voters agreed with the statement, the election has been decided and President Trump should move on and focus on ensuring a peaceful and orderly transition. Miller wrote, I tried to walk the president through this earlier, but he won't have any of it. John Carl joins us now. John, what more are you learning involving the former president? Uh, Stephanie, in an extraordinary rebuke, a New York judge has found Donald Trump in contempt of court uh, for, for defying a subpoena from the New York Attorney General, and the judge has actually ordered him to pay a fine of $10,000 a day. Uh, the, the former president's lawyers say they will challenge this ruling or try to find some accommodation. Of course, $10,000 a day can add up quite quickly. It certainly can. John, thanks so much. Thank you, Stephanie. When we come back, the terrifying video, children flying out of their school bus seats. What caused this? Coming up. And the dramatic legal victory for a woman who faced the death penalty for allegedly fatally beating her two-year-old daughter. Our in-depth look at the Melissa Lucio case and what comes next now that her execution has been stayed. But up next, our journey to West Virginia. It was ground zero for the opioid crisis and now communities in that state are being battered by fentanyl. Our series, Poisoned, continues when we come back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you.
The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Okay, brace yourself for this frightening video. There it is. This is from Albuquerque, New Mexico, of a school bus being struck by a car, allegedly street racing at more than 100 miles per hour. You can see the kids tossed there. The collision led to nearly two dozen kids on board the bus flying out of their seats. Seven children were hospitalized from the incident that took place back in February. The driver, who was allegedly street racing, was arrested, and police are still looking for a second driver. Could have been so much worse. Next to the fentanyl crisis wreaking havoc in communities across the country, the overdoses, drug seizures, and concerns continue to grow from coast to coast. But some experts tell us before we try to get a sense of just how bad things could get, we need to explore how this all began. That's why our Bob Woodruff traveled for part two of our weekly series, Poisoned, to West Virginia, where the opioid epidemic has now evolved into a fentanyl nightmare. How bad is it getting, fentanyl use? I picked up a friend not too long ago, actually. He was doing it. General Jonas, company 61 is That's us, 61. This is a daily occurrence for the Clarksburg EMS team. 38 year old female requested detox. She's in a blue hoodie in front of the library. This woman is going through withdrawal and is seeking help. Right there, you take care of us. Okay. She was using last week. Uh, she has the urge to, to use again, and she doesn't want to. They hope she ends up one of the lucky ones, because what this team sees most are overdoses. Pretty daily, probably two or three times a day. Usually when you get one, you get three or four. It's, it's just 100 times worse. Fentanyl is an opioid up to 50 times more powerful than heroin, killing people old or young. There is no age. I've seen teenagers and I've seen 70 year olds. Three overdoses today alone. So do you think this is going to stop? I think it's going to get worse. 18, a female. That's probably an overdose.
This is Clarksburg, West Virginia, an estate many consider to be ground zero of this opioid crisis that has just swept through America. In 2021, this state ranked the highest in terms of overdose death rate in the country per capita. Those maps tell you how it all began. Those states are really struggling, and they have been for many years. But the amazing thing is that it's all over the country now. Fentanyl is responsible for most of the drug deaths in this state. But the crisis really started nearly three decades ago, and no one saw it coming. It begins with prescription painkillers prescribed by doctors. In the 1990s, pharmaceutical companies started to market hundreds of millions of prescription pain pills in towns like this one. At first, to counter chronic pain from surgeries or accidents. Pharmaceutical companies targeted these vulnerable regions like West Virginia, um, Eastern Tennessee, because doctors in those areas were already prescribing a lot of other kinds of pills. The idea that opioid prescription painkillers can be prescribed to all manner of pain patients and doctors will run virtually no risk of those patients getting addicted. But risk of addiction quickly became obvious in towns like Clarksburg. Megan Malcolm has lived here and with addiction nearly her whole life. Pharmaceutical companies are probably uh, the worst thing that's ever happened to this state. Um, nobody was prepared. Nobody knew that they were going to get uh, a drug that was supposed to help alleviate pain that was going to tear down their entire heritage. There's not one person that I didn't know by the time I was 18 that was physically and fully addicted to opioids. These were areas hard hit by economic pain, physical pain. A lot of them were, you know, factories have gone out, coal mines have shuttered down. If you look at these buildings, the windows are shattered. It's completely abandoned. This used to be the center of the economy. The glass factories that closed down in the 1970s and 80s. About 800 jobs were lost. Purdue Pharma began to sell OxyContin, the painkiller often referred to as Oxy, in 1996. And a phenomenon began to take place. I was addicted to Oxys by the time I was 16, 17 years old. Purdue aggressively marketed the drug as basically non-addictive, providing videos like these to medical practitioners. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. And doctors began to write prescription after prescription. I really feel like I'm in the place I'm supposed to be. Lou Artenzio was once one of those doctors. You know, the drug companies told me this was a good idea. It was control people's pain. People had a right to that. You know, you want to make it better. So, and these drugs are safe. They're not addictive, we were told. Of course, you think about it now. That was a it's lie. It's a lie. It was a foolish idea. You get feelings of guilt? Certainly, certainly. I, I, I deal with it every day. I mean, a lot better than I was. I never envisioned prescribing something with pain would have this catastrophic tidal wave effect. Lou himself got caught in that tidal wave, becoming addicted to the very pills he'd been prescribing. How many pills were you taking? I, I started out with one sample pain pill at the end of the day. In the end, it was 30 and 40 a day. And then I'd slowly run out, and then I was sick. Then I just wanted to not be sick, because coming off opiates, you're really sick. Yeah, dope you're sick. You're totally, yeah, dope sick, right. Dope sick is a term used to describe the intense opiate withdrawal symptoms. It's also the title for the Hulu series starring Michael Keaton, who plays a doctor in a small West Virginia town prescribing his patients Oxycontin, then becoming addicted himself. It was very accurate, uncannily accurate. It really shook me up, tell you the truth. How do you do it over the long term? The character is actually based in part on Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who practiced in the Eastern Appalachian region of Tennessee. So while this was happening in West Virginia and dope sick and the show, and, and yet the same thing's happening in Tennessee. The exact same thing is happening in Tennessee, and it was happening to a young doctor fresh out of residency. So this all 
started because the, the dentist gave you something to kill the pain. Absolutely, and, and you know, I'd had some dental work done and they gave me samples right out of the closet and said, here, if you need these, you can take one every four hours. In my chief resident year, on my way home from work, I uh, pulled up to a red light and was, was having a pretty tough day. I thought, you know my patients take these things all the time. And broke one out, broke it in half, and threw it in my mouth. And by the time I got home, I felt like I'd found a cure for about everything that ailed me. Uh, anxiety, depression, all of it had melted away. I knew their addictive potential. What I didn't realize was, was how quickly it happened. I would go into my, my bathroom where I got dressed in the morning and I laid my kids' pictures next to my sink and I would look at those pictures in the morning and cry because I couldn't stop. I mean, you're a father, right? That's the most important thing in your life, but it's not. The most important thing in your life is this pill that you have to have in order for this to be okay. Just in West Virginia alone, over the span of six years in the mid-2000s, Pharmaceutical companies sold about 780 million pain pills to the people here in this state. That means approximately 430 pills available to every man, woman, and child. What does the future hold? What does the future hold for kids that grew up with parents that they lost and their own risk for substance use disorder going forward? to make things better. Steve and Lou have been sober for many years. Now they're trying to help others do the same. Steve's recovery center is based in Nashville. When I started going around and beating all of it. It's one thing to say I'm sorry. And it's another thing to go out and try to make a difference. Lou's center is here in the town where he once practiced medicine, now providing a place to live, to eat, and find therapy through faith. Salvation was made available to all. Though Oxycontin and other painkillers slowly became harder to prescribe, the pharmaceutical companies and doctors had already created an enormous new population of people suffering from addiction. They got rid of oxys and everything. It wasn't so easy. But we, by then, we were all addicted to them. And, um, it was just replaced with heroin. The damage was already done. Heroin replaced those pills. Heroin has fallen off substantially. And now, phase three. Fentanyl is being found throughout the drug supply, leading to more overdoses and far more fatalities, putting those living with addiction at greatest risk. Yeah. I've had four of my friends die within the past eight months for fentanyl. How bad is it getting here in this town? Um, people I love die um, quite often. The opioid epidemic switch to fentanyl was not easily noticed by users, often having no idea the dealers were adding it to their drugs. Did any of you guys know that there was fentanyl when you first took it? No. So you thought it was heroin, heroin or yeah, meth yeah. or something, and then yeah. it's just added in? Yeah. yeah. How many of you took fentanyl without even knowing that it was in there? Why didn't they tell you that there was fentanyl in it? Because they just want to sell the product. The folks are, that are dying um, are younger and in their 20s and, and 30s. We lose multiple patients every week. You just lost some this week? Absolutely. In the week before that? The week before that and the week before that and the week before that. There's not weeks go by that we don't. Recent data suggests that over 70% of America's heroin supply right now contains fentanyl. Just a recipe for disaster. It's poison. It's pure poison. You don't know what it is. All I've ever known is addiction. And most of the people that I love, the people that I grew up with, that's all they've known too. It's hard to have hope because we're just West Virginia. Who's going to come help a bunch of West Virginia residents deal with the trauma that they've endured from being addicts since they were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. You know, Big Pharma made money off of us. And now drug dealers are. It's a seemingly endless cycle for those who feel forgotten by the system. Opioids have since extended beyond the Appalachian region. Last year, states reported an unprecedented number of opioid deaths, most caused by fentanyl. 
and nationwide fentanyl is now the leading cause of death for those between the ages of 25 and 44. Is there a link between OxyContin prescribing and fentanyl today? And, and yes, absolutely, it's, it's a direct line. These folks that are coming in with fentanyl, 98% of them got started with pain pills. There's no way to deal with the drug problem until you, unless you deal with the people. Do you think you will get off the addiction? I have no choice. If I don't, I'll die. I'm surprised I'm not dead now. Four days a week. And to shield those she loves most from suffering the same fate, Megan, a mother of three, can no longer be a part of her children's lives. So you might never see your kids again. It is best just to stay away, because I don't know if I'll ever be better completely. And I don't want them to ever, ever have to deal with the things that I had to. In order to fix the problem, you have to understand how it all started. Our thanks to Bob Woodruff for his continued work on our series, Poisoned. Still ahead, Megan Thee Stallion's emotional interview about the 2020 incident in which she was shot. And the heart-pounding mid-air stunt that didn't go as planned, involving two cousins, two single-seat air crashes, and synchronized nosedives. Plus, with summer looming, we're learning concert tickets are another thing that's going up in price. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the new owner of Twitter about who he wants to be a part of his newest business. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. The first Coachella Music Festival in two years wrapped up this weekend after selling out in record time and at record prices. And that may be an indicator of what's ahead for this concert season. Just how much are prices rising? Let's take a look by the numbers.
Ticket prices worldwide were up 11% in 2021 compared to 2019, and they are even higher in North America, up 14%. That's according to the world's largest concert promoter, Live Nation Entertainment. So what will it cost to catch your favorites live show this summer? Well, Concert Trade Magazine Polestar reports the average ticket price for Billie Eilish is $118.89. We are specific here. That's compared to $70.50 pre-pandemic. Elton John will cost you $167.87, a more than $35 increase. And the Eagles are charging $227.29. That's up about $20. But fans don't seem deterred by sticker shock. Ticket sales are up 45% through mid-February compared to 2019. Concert executives say the soaring prices aren't about inflation, but demand. They say even higher price tickets at secondary vendors like StubHub show concert goers are willing to pay the price for premium show experiences. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The grim discovery of the body of a National Guardsman along the Texas border. And the iconic Corvette is getting a climate-friendly makeover. We have the details. And meet the 13-year-old who just graduated from college. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! President Zelensky meeting with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. We want to see uh, Ukraine uh, remain a, a democratic country able to protect its, uh, uh, its sovereign territory. The British Defense Secretary now assessing the number of Russian troops killed since the war began is around 15,000. And new videos showing a fire erupting at a Russian oil depot near the border with Ukraine. The cause of the fire not known. And Ukraine is not claiming responsibility at the moment. All this as the new Russian offensive still shows no sign of slowing down. With explosions happening in the southern coastal city of Odessa and in the port city of Mariupol. 
a New York State Supreme Court judge of finding former President Trump in contempt of court, fining him $10,000 per day in a dispute over a subpoena issued by the New York Attorney General. As part of her civil case against the former president, New York Attorney General Letitia James subpoenaed documents and other items from Trump as she investigates his business practices. Trump missed March 31st deadline to hand over the material. He maintains he has no records to turn over, but the judge says Trump and his lawyers have not shown they have conducted a proper search for the records under the subpoena. And as mentioned, the AG is conducting a civil probe into Trump Organization's business practices. Search crews have recovered the body of Texas National Guard Specialist Bishop Evans, who went missing after jumping in the river on the U.S.-Mexico border to help a migrant who was struggling to swim across. He was found three days after he was reported missing in the Rio Grande. The local sheriff said Evans jumped into the river without his jacket or radio. Migrant rescues are common in the river along the Texas border, and the attempted crossings are sometimes deadly. Voters in France re-elected President Emmanuel Macron for a second term. He defeated his far-right rival, Marine Le Pen, by winning more than 58% of the vote. Five years ago, Macron defeated her with more than 66% of the vote. In an interview with CBS Mornings, rap superstar Megan Thee Stallion said she was scared for her life during an incident where she claimed she was shot by rapper Tory Lanez. He is standing up over the window okay. shooting. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to move too quick, like, because I'm like, oh, my God, if I take the wrong step, I don't know if he can shoot something that's, like, super important. I don't know if he could shoot me and kill me. Like, Were you afraid for your life at that I time? I was really scared because I had never been shot at before. Megan claims the incident, which unfolded in the Hollywood Hills after a party on July 12, 2020, stemmed from an argument. Earlier this month, Lanes, whose legal name is Daystar Peterson, was briefly jailed after a judge said he had violated a protective order in the felony assault case in which he's charged with shooting Megan. He posted bail and was released several hours later. A September trial date was selected and Peterson was told to return for a June hearing. He is pleaded not guilty. the moment when things took a turn. Diving. The daring aviation stunt that went wrong as millions were watching. Cousins Luke Aikens and Andy Farrington attempting the first ever plane swap 12,000 feet up. While in a free fall, they were each supposed to jump from their planes and land in the other. The pair jumping out as their planes entered the nosedive. But then one plane flips over, going into a downward spiral. With the silver plane still controlled, Luke chases it down and climbs into the cockpit. Pit. I'm recovered. But Andy still in free fall, dodging the planes and activating his emergency parachute. Nice to see you again. Both cousins visibly relieved on the ground, Andy emotional as he hugged his children. After years of appeals, a mother convicted of murdering her two-year-old daughter, who has maintained her innocence, has been granted a stay just two days before she was set to be executed. Melissa Lucio and her family learned the news today after weeks of protests and growing calls to save her life. But this isn't a fight that's been won for Lucio. Instead, it's just the latest twist in this case that has captivated the country. ABC's Maria Villarreal reports. A life spared and prayers answered for now. I just want to say thank you to everybody who has supported me and given me love. It's exciting. It's overwhelming. Melissa Lucio's family celebrates a decision from an appeals court to issue a stay of execution following a growing movement to get her off death row. But this 15-year-long battle isn't over yet. And if you want to see this whole maddening system in one story, Consider the case of Melissa Lucio. Melissa Lucio insists she was wrongfully convicted of killing her two-year-old daughter, Mariah, after a tragic accident 15 years ago. Free Melissa Lucio! I don't want my mom to be executed. I don't want to lose it. In Texas, 197 people sit on death row, and just six are women. The only one that had, until just now, an execution date was 53-year-old Melissa Lucio convicted of killing her two-year-old daughter, Mariah. The appeals court halted her execution two days before it was scheduled in order to consider new evidence, her conviction leaning heavily on a lengthy interrogation. You know something is wrong. No, sir, I don't. You know something is wrong. No, sir, I don't. 
if I bring you all those pictures, if I beat you half to death like that little child was beat, I bet you you'd die too. In February 2007, paramedics arrived at Lucio's home to find Mariah unresponsive. She told police the toddler fell asleep and never woke up, admitting she fell down a steep staircase two days prior but didn't seem seriously hurt. Investigators with the Harlingen Police Department and Texas Rangers confronted Melissa about bruising on her daughter's body, taking turns interrogating her about the death. This is your chance to set it straight, because right now it looks like capital murder. Right now it looks like you're a cold-blooded killer. Now, are you a cold-blooded killer? No, I'm not. Or were you a frustrated mother who just took it out on her? We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all get upset. We already know what happened. We already know what happened. In the 2020 Hulu documentary, The State of Texas versus Melissa, Lucia relives those first few hours after losing her daughter. They wanted me to admit to something that I was not capable of doing to my child. Lucio denied killing Mariah more than 100 times during the interrogation, lasting into the early morning hours, but eventually confessed. So they didn't give her a choice to tell the truth and to tell what she knew happened. She has learned over the course of her life that if she wants an abuser to stop doing what they're doing, she gives them what they want. And that's ultimately what she did here. At the time of Mariah's death, Lucio had 12 children in her home and was pregnant with twins. Her oldest son, John, says his mom was strict, but never abusive. Do you believe that your mom killed Mariah? Not at all, ma'am. My mother, I don't even think she'll kill a fly. Lucio's team filed a clemency petition with the Texas Board of Pardons and Parole that laid out the reasons why her sentence should be commuted. It references the Cameron County District Attorney, Armando Villalobos, who tried Lucio's case and used it in his re-election campaign to prove he was tough on crime. I'm Armando Villalobos, Cameron County District Attorney, and this is my office. Villalobos was later indicted and convicted of taking bribes while in office, now serving a 13-year sentence. The petition also notes Child Protective Services had investigated Lucio in the past and found evidence of neglect, but never abuse. It cites video from an interview with Lucio's other children, where one of them said they saw Mariah pushed down the stairs by another sibling. And did you see her fall, or did somebody tell you that that's what had happened to her? None of her children were allowed to testify in court, and her legal team asserts crucial evidence was kept from the jury about Lucio's history as a sexual assault victim. We got it wrong. We need to learn that the criminal justice system fails sometimes, and we certainly failed. Johnny Galvan was on the jury that convicted Melissa Lucio in July 2008. He's now one of several jurors speaking out against her execution. We made the wrong decision because they gave us the wrong information. There was evidence withheld that was not presented to the jury. Did Melissa Lucio get a fair trial? Not at all. Lucio's case spent years going through appeals, eventually landing in the Fifth Circuit. More than half of the federal judges that heard her case agreed. Crucial evidence had been excluded from the original trial, but they couldn't overturn Lucio's conviction because of strict guidelines in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. A federal judge just a couple of weeks ago uh, issued a decision in Melissa's case saying that this case represents a systematic miscarriage of justice. He said it's a train of injustice. Cameron County's current DA, Louis Sines, says he disagrees with claims that new evidence would exonerate her, but that he welcomes the added scrutiny. Her case catching the attention of Texas lawmakers from both sides of the aisle. Reality star Kim Kardashian, famed Latina civil rights activist Dolores Huerta, and Amanda Knox, who was acquitted of the 2007 murder of a roommate in Italy. So when you're in an interrogation, they offer instead a sort of soft, like, oh, maybe you made a mistake, maybe you're overwhelmed. I can understand where you're coming from, which gives you the impression that they actually are in, they have your best interest at heart. John is thankful so many people are pushing to help his mother. Just after the Court of Appeals decision to issue a stay on her April 27th execution, John told me, we've been praying for a very long time and he's heard us, adding, 
it's not over. Texas Governor Greg Abbott hasn't responded to our request for comment on if he'll commute Melissa's sentence. I'll make a decision once it comes to me. The uncertainty still weighing heavy on her son's heart. We spoke with John just before that stay of execution on what he thought could be one of his last visits with his mom. And so today I kind of expressed myself to her and everything was let out. It had to be let out. I've been holding it in for too long. What did you tell her? What were some of the things that you shared with her that were important for you to share with her? I mean, I'm crying. My wife and I are crying, and I'm, I, I started telling her, and she's asking me, everything okay? And I started telling her, it really isn't. So I told her, I'm, I'm scared. And I've been scared every time I come short. I lied. I lied to her. I make it seem like I'm not scared, but I really am. John and his wife, Michelle, gaining solace in her strength. The strength that she has is very contagious, and I know it comes from the man above, and she just, it just rubs off into us. The execution halted for now. Melissa saying in a statement from her lawyers, I thank God for my life. I've always trusted in him. I am grateful the court has given me the chance to live and prove my innocence. A complicated case will continue to watch. Our thanks to Medea for that. In other news, General Motors says it will soon offer an electric version of the Corvette. The company plans to release a hybrid model next year, and a fully electric version will be available sometime after that. GM says it will have an all-electric lineup of vehicles by 2035. And most 13-year-olds are either in 7th, 8th grade, right? Well, we want to introduce you to a brilliant young man, Elliot Tanner, who is already pursuing his PhD. He's very much ahead of his peers. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with his story. I suppose sort of my daily schedule is waking up, getting dressed, having breakfast. Elliot Tanner sounds like your average 13-year-old, getting lost in video games. We still have to tell him to clean his room and take a shower. Oh, yeah. But Elliot is not your typical teen. He'll soon earn his bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota with a major in physics and a minor in math. Remind us, how old are you? 13. We just keep providing for him and he just keeps consuming, so it's not like we're trying to get him through anything quicker. Elliot started taking college classes at the age of nine after completing high school in just two years. His parents call him a sponge, constantly soaking up knowledge. He had started reading when he was maybe two, uh, just three. And we thought, oh, well, that's interesting. You're reading. We didn't teach you to read. He's just a 13-year-old kid. It's just that he uh, learns quicker and is uh, very bright. Now Elliot has been accepted into the University of Minnesota's physics PhD program. He wants to be a high-energy theoretical physicist and ultimately a physics professor. And I'm hoping to become a professor at the University of Minnesota in order to also spread this joy and passion for physics with other people. So you want to come back and give back? Yeah, reduce, reuse, recycle. Congratulations, Elliot. I have a feeling we'll be seeing that young man around next few years once again. Well, before we go tonight, here is the image of the day. Floats, costumes, and performances filling the streets of, you know it, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. The Rio Carnival is considered to be the biggest carnival in the world, drawing up to two million people a day. The festival was canceled last year, of course, due to COVID, making this year extra special. And Rio Carnival actually lasts the entire week. It goes until Saturday. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the Supreme Court hears oral arguments in a case testing the First Amendment at issue prayer in school, or in this case, on the high school football field. Plus, the first COVID treatment for children under the age of 12. We have the details. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. More than a dozen wildfires are continuing to wreak havoc on landscapes all over the western U.S., despite winds that have lowered the chances of rapid spread. Most of the fires are burning in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, regions plagued with dangerous fire conditions, which have allowed the wildfires to explode as soon as they sparked. Why while less wind and cooler weather should slow the spread of the fire, persistent drought conditions in the area has left the region bone dry, allowing the fire to spread. The Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles has ordered a court to consider new evidence regarding the case of Melissa Lucio and the death of her two-year-old daughter. Lucio was originally scheduled to be executed this Wednesday. Her lawyers say new evidence shows that the cause of her daughter's injuries and subsequent death were caused by a fall down a steep staircase outside their apartment in Texas. They say Lucio was coerced into a false confession after hours of intense police interrogation. Chaos and confusion captured on a body camera. New video released tonight shows the moments after the deadly onset shooting during the filming of the movie Rust and a police interview with star Alec Baldwin. In the video, Baldwin asks the detectives if he's going to be charged with anything. Despite all of this evidence, the sheriff says key pieces are still missing and they are waiting on the FBI's firearm and ballistics analysis. Next tonight, Elon Musk closing a blockbuster deal to buy Twitter, the world's richest man buying the social media giant for about $44 billion. Major changes already expected, Musk repeatedly saying he sees Twitter as a platform for free speech. Many already asking, will anything happen to former President Trump's suspended account? Ariel Reshef reports. Tonight, the world's richest man in charge of Tesla and SpaceX is set to become a media mogul. Twitter announcing that Elon Musk has bought the social media giant for $44 billion, writing, upon completion of the transaction, Twitter will become a privately held company. The New York Times reporting Musk negotiated the details with Twitter's 11-member board overnight and into the early hours this morning. The deal means Twitter stockholders will get $54.20 for every share they own. So for a lot of shareholders, this is kind of a, a, a quick win. Uh, it's a very nice quick win. Simple. Musk announced his proposal in a tweet just 11 days ago, calling it his best and final offer. He's long been critical of how Twitter manages content on its platform, telling a TED conference his takeover plan is about free speech. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. He's got well over 80 million users. He tweets a lot. He has been very public with some of his criticism about the platform. So 
He's putting his money where his tweets are. He's buying the asset. Musk has talked about adding the ability to edit tweets and is promising to make Twitter's algorithm on how tweets get displayed public to build more trust. And he wants to eliminate spam, but he hasn't said whether he will allow banned users back on. That includes former President Trump, who told Fox News that even if he's reinstated, he intends to stay off the platform in favor of his own Truth Social. And Stephanie, this move by Musk is now being hailed by some who believe that Twitter had been too heavy handed when it came to limiting speech. Others concerned that Musk might be too lenient. Bottom line is if this deal goes through by the end of the year, the richest man in America will own one of the most important social media networks in the world. Stephanie. Certainly does. Ariel, thank you. A federal judge announced a pause on the Biden administration's rollback of Title 42. This decision, a result of a lawsuit filed by the states of Missouri, Louisiana, and Arizona. So here's a quick reminder as to what Title 42 is. Title 42 is a clause of the 1944 Public Health Services Law that allows the government to prevent the introduction of individuals during certain public health emergencies. Joining us now to break down what this decision means is ABC News contributor Maria Elena Salinas. Maria Elena, thank you so much for joining us. What does this judge's decision mean for the ongoing crisis at our border? Well, Stephanie, you know, as you said, this was this is only temporary. It's a temporary restraining order. So now I think we have to wait and see how the administration will react or how the CDC will react. So just like you said before, you know, we need to remember that Title 42 is a health measure and that it was used, to, and some might say that it was abused by the Trump administration to prevent asylum seekers from applying at the border. So the issue of lifting Title 42 really has been seen through a political lens on both parties. So it was effective in keeping asylum seekers from applying at the border and waiting their turn, but it wasn't effective in keeping undocumented immigrants from crossing the border. They will cross when they can, and they have been doing that for not years, decades, with or without Title 42. So, you know, we really should not be treating asylum seekers as if they were undocumented immigrants because they do have the legal right to request asylum and the U.S. does have the legal obligation to at least listen to their cases. Right. And Maria Elena, today a Republican delegation visited our nation's southern border and it coincided with the tragic news of a Texas National Guard soldier who was found dead. What do we know about this guardsman and how did some of the members of Congress react to his death? That's right. Uh, it was a specialist, uh, Bishop Evans, and he disappeared a few days ago. Uh, he, apparently, he was tr had uh, gone into the river trying to save someone, someone who was crossing the river, and he noticed that the person was in danger. And even though the immigrants that he was trying to save did make it out alive, he didn't. He disappeared, and, and his body was found today. Now, several members of Congress, like you said, did go to the border today, and they happened to tie the drowning of specialist Evans to the lifting of, of, of Title 42, which really should not be connected, or at least to President Biden's immigration policies. Uh, McCarthy claimed that there were reports that the person that he was trying to rescue on the river was carrying drugs. Uh, it, it really surprised me to hear that because it would be hard to believe since drugs usually come into the country, hidden in vehicles through legal border crossings or through tunnels or sometimes boats, sometimes planes, but not by someone trying to swim over to the U.S. because we really doubt that very powerful wealthy cartels would risk sending their product with a guy carrying it as he tried to swim across. But it definitely was able to be used by uh, a lot of members of, of, the, of, of Congress, Republican members of Congress, saying that because of these immigrants and trying to carry drugs over, uh, Specialist Bishop Evans died. He risked, uh, he risked his life. It's not the first time that you see border agents trying to save migrants when they cross the border. Uh, unfortunately, this time it ended up with a death, but it happens very often. They risk their lives either crossing by foot or by the, the river. And, and this was the result. The result was a, a tragedy for, for Specialist Evans, but it re really is a far reach trying to link it to President Biden's immigration policies, which are not really clear because up to this point, he has really uh, tried to keep most of uh, former President Trump's policies. Our thoughts are certainly with uh, Specialist Evans and his, his family. Maria Elena Salinas, thank you so much. 
Now to the war in Ukraine. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Kyiv today meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky. They offered new military assistance and diplomacy, but also strong words from Russia, for Russia rather, and a new threat of nuclear response. Marcus Moore reports from Kyiv. Tonight, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with a chilling warning. The risk of nuclear war is a real one. Speaking to state-run media, Lavrov said, quote, the danger is serious. It is real. It cannot be underestimated. He added that he did not want to see these risks of nuclear war, quote, artificially inflated. The warning came after a high-stakes visit by top American officials with Ukrainian President Zelensky in Kyiv. After the trip, U.S. Defense Secretary Austin was blunt in discussing U.S. goals. We want to see Russia uh, uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Russia has already failed in its original goals for the war and announced more assistance, including more than $322 million in new military aid for Ukraine. We do know that a sovereign, independent Ukraine will be around a lot longer than Vladimir Putin's on the scene. And today, President Biden said he would nominate veteran U.S. diplomat Bridget Brink to serve as the next U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Today, Russia unleashing new attacks on at least five railway stations and fuel sites across central and western Ukraine. But inside Russia, a massive fire engulfed a fuel depot in Bryansk, 60 miles from the border, seen in video circulating online. It is not clear how the inferno started. Outside the capital in Kyiv, some fear the Russians might return. The heaviest fighting has moved to the east, but amidst the devastation here in Irpin, locals tell me they are concerned that the Russians might try to come back to this city, but they say they're not afraid that they're ready to fight. I asked Ferdosi and Andrei what they thought of Secretary Austin and Blinken's visit to Ukraine. Blinken and Austin приехали сюда, в Украину. Что вы думаете? Both said they are grateful and that without support from the U.S., it would be hard for Ukraine to stand up against these monsters. Our thanks to Marcus for that. Next tonight, the Supreme Court hearing oral arguments in a case brought by a former high school football coach who was suspended for refusing to stop praying at the 50-yard line after games. As we've been reporting on Prime, Coach Joe Kennedy is suing the Bremerton Public School District in Washington State. The case testing the First Amendment, which says both the government cannot establish religion, but also says that it cannot impede free exercise of it. Senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer was inside the Supreme Court today for the debate and joins me now. Devin, so what's at stake in this case for public schools? Yeah, Stephanie, the Supreme Court has long said that public school teachers and coaches cannot lead students in prayer, uh, but this case could expand the ability of those teachers and coaches to practice their religious faith while on the job in view of other students uh, outside the classroom on the playing field. Coach Kennedy, as you said, and prayed quietly with his uh, students on the 50-yard line after games for years, uh, sometimes with a lot of students, sometimes with just a couple. Uh, but in 2015, the school district said, you know what, this crosses a line. It crosses the line of separation of church and state, uh, and unless you stop, uh, you'll be suspended. And that's what happened. Uh, and some parents had complained at the time as well about potential pressuring uh, of their students. Uh, they, they worried about a pray-to-play scheme that the coach may have been running. He denied all of that, but today argued that as a public school employee, he should not have to hide his faith on the job, and the justices debated that question for nearly two hours, Stephanie. This case getting a lot of attention, and of course, this court has a strong conservative majority. Any indications today on how the justices might rule? Yeah, the conservative majority, very sympathetic to uh, uh, Coach Kennedy's argument today that public school employees should be able to make these displays on the job, even if they can't lead students in prayer. Justice Samuel Alito, one of the top conservatives on the court, was vigorously defending the activity. He noted that Kennedy did, didn't invite any students to come over, also didn't turn them away. Uh, but we saw the liberals pushing back as Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, outright questioning why the coach needed to pray at the 
50-yard line. She said, what religion requires you to do it at that spot? Uh, interesting, Stephanie, Judge uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, perhaps a swing vote in all of this. He is a high school coach himself and a Catholic. Uh, he said, you know, the freedom of religion is paramount in this country, but he worried about the pressure, uh, peer pressure on those students of minority faiths, other faiths to have to pray at the, at the mid, uh, midfield line. Uh, so suggesting perhaps he could go either way on this one. A decision, though, in this case uh, is, decide, is expected by the end of June, Stephanie. Interesting arguments on both sides. We will, of course, be watching. Thank you so much, Devin. Thanks, Stephanie. Now to the pandemic, and today the promising news about a COVID treatment for children, including those children five and under who do not yet have access to the vaccine. Eva Pilgrim reports. Tonight, a green light for the first COVID treatment for children under 12. The FDA approving the drug remdesivir for infants as young as four weeks old. Part of this age group include those children under the age of five who don't yet have an approved vaccine. And this is welcomed news to physicians and parents, especially of children who are high risk. The antiviral remdesivir, the first COVID treatment approved for adults, can be given as an injection to hospitalized children and those with mild to moderate COVID or at high risk for severe disease. It comes as pediatric COVID infections are climbing again, up 43% from two weeks ago. And tonight, the World Health Organization is investigating whether COVID or a common cold virus have any connection to a mysterious outbreak of hepatitis in children. Scientists tracking 169 cases in a dozen countries countries, including the U.S. 17 children needed liver transplants and one died, though officials didn't say where. There are some kids in this specific cluster of hepatitis cases who tested positive for adenovirus and also had COVID or another respiratory virus, which is why the World Health Organization and the CDC are trying to comb through all the cases to try to find a casual link between them. Scientists stressed the hepatitis was not caused by the COVID vaccine. The vast majority of the children were unvaccinated. The CDC now asking doctors to keep a lookout for hepatitis symptoms, fever, nausea, and a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes. Eva Pilgrim, ABC News, New York. Now to those bombshell text messages we got a glimpse of today from former President Trump's Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. The text messages show Meadows at the nexus of conspiracy theories claiming the election had been stolen. They also reveal his key role in the events of January 6. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has those details. One of the newly revealed text messages says that some of Donald Trump's staunchest allies in Congress wanted him to declare martial law to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. The text was sent from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, one of many text messages first reported by CNN that Meadows turned over to the January 6th committee. In our private chat with only members, Green wrote to Meadows, several are saying the only way to save our republic is for Trump to call for martial law. The text messages, which sources who have seen the material turned over to the January 6th committee, tells ABC News are authentic, include numerous texts from January 6th of Republicans close to Trump pleading with him to do something to stop the attack on the Capitol. Amidst the attack, even Marjorie Taylor Greene texted Meadows, quote, please tell the president to calm people. This isn't the way to solve anything. Former Trump chief of staff Reince Priebus texted in all caps, tell them to go home. And Donald Trump Jr. begged Meadows to push his father to make a statement, texting, this is one you go to the mattresses on. They will try to expletive his entire legacy on this if it gets worse. Text messages also show that some in Trump's inner circle were raising questions about his bogus claims that the election was stolen. Jared Kushner texted Meadows this fact check, showing that Trump's claims that election workers in Georgia had suitcases stuffed with ballots was a lie. And senior Trump campaign advisor Jason Miller sent Meadows a poll showing that 67% of voters agreed with the statement, the election has been decided and President Trump should move on and focus on ensuring a peaceful and orderly transition. Miller wrote, I tried to walk the president through this earlier, but he won't have any of it. 
Our thanks to John Carl. And still to come, our look around the world, including why a state of emergency was extended in El Salvador. And our conversation with the very first out and seated transgender state legislator, her advice for anyone out there still discovering themselves. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A state of emergency in El Salvador has been extended by a month, which the interim president says is necessary after a surge of gang killings, but that rights groups say the extension infringes civil liberties. The measures which enact emergency powers to limit some constitutional rights went into effect late last month after the Central American country registered 62 homicides in just one day, the highest toll in two days decades. Since then, authorities said they have arrested more than 16,000 suspected gang members. Human rights organizations have said the detentions include arbitrary arrests of non-gang members and abuses of authority. At least 100 people were killed and, quote, burned beyond recognition after a tragic explosion at an illegal oil refinery in Nigeria. Vehicles were left burnt, as you can see there, and fuel pulled on the ground. Authorities say unemployment and poverty in the oil-producing region have made illegal crude oil refining an attractive and deadly business. Emmanuel Macron comfortably defeated far-right rival Marine Le Pen on Sunday. His supporters erupted with joy as the results appeared on a giant screen by the Eiffel Tower. In his victory speech, he acknowledged that many had only voted for him only to keep Le Pen out and promised to tackle the fact many French people feel that their living standards are slipping. Virginia delegate Danica Rome is the very first out and seated transgender state legislator. Rome was a part of the group, if you may remember, that flipped Republican seats in the 2017 election. But outside of politics, being a delegate is only one of the many titles she's had over the years, from musician to stepmom. Her memoir, Burn the Page, a true story of torching doubts, blazing trails, and igniting change, is out tomorrow. Delegate Rome, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Steph. It's Thanks. so good to see you. Good to see you, too, live and in person. When you became the first openly transgender legislator in this country and defeated a Republican who held the seat for 25 years and who went as far as describing himself as Virginia's chief homophobe, since then, you've held your seat for three terms.
terms. Hard to believe so much time has passed already. Uh, but what made you run for this seat in the 13th District of Virginia? Sure, well, what made me run for the 13th District in the first place was, like a lot of women, I was asked. And as the new executive director of Emerge Virginia, which trains uh, and recruits Democratic women to run for office in the first place, we have data that shows that a lot of women often need to be asked in order to run, whereas a lot of men tend to take the initiative. Uh, I kept my campaign promise to expand Medicaid. We have now enrolled more than 650,000 Virginians in quality affordable health insurance throughout the Commonwealth, including more than 30,000 people in Greater Prince William alone, which is incredible. And when I look at what we've uh, ran on in the first place of actually having inclusive leadership, so we're not singling out and stigmatizing the very people we are elected to serve, but we're actually taking care of the day-to-day -day constituent service issues like traffic, jobs, schools, health care, and equality too, then that means we're making Virginia a more inclusive commonwealth where you're actually welcomed to be in Virginia because of who you are, not despite it. When you're walking down the street and you run in, you run into people. What what are some of the things that you hear? What is that? What is their feedback on on the last three terms? Oh well, first that they all hate Route 28. <laughs> so that's the first one of the first things I got to take care of. Um, and at the same time, they talk to me about you know wanting to protect the environment in Gainesville and Haymark and Western Prince William in general, which is why I introduced and we passed my bill to ban above ground transmission lines along the I-66 corridor between Gainesville and Haymarket for the rest of this decade. And you know one of the things I like to really talk about here is that at a time where national politics becomes so toxic and we are seeing, especially in a lot of Republican trifecta states right now, so many legislators attacking trans kids, going after LGBTQ youth in general, that they're picking on their most vulnerable constituents instead of taking care of literal concrete issues that could actually improve their day-to-day -day lives. Well, that's what I do. And this is why we've passed 32 of my bills in my two and a half terms in office. 32 bills, that's impressive. Yeah. You bring up kids. You write in the book, I saw exactly zero representation of LGBTQ people in my life, and I stayed firmly, deeply in the closet because of it. There are parents right now that say they, they don't want the issue of gender identity and sexual orientation brought into the classroom, especially for kindergartners to third graders. With that conversation happening right now across the country as a stepmom, what is that conversation like with your stepdaughter? So, well, the first thing I want to say is actually, let's look at this more broadly, right? If it's coming up at all in an elementary school, it's because a child is trying to come out, trying to talk to someone, trying to just say who they are, right? And are you going to be in a state where a teacher is going to have to go, I can't talk about this, I can't deal with this, and just like put their, you know, fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 nothing's happening? Or are you going to have an inclusive, welcoming environment where you're just teaching people to be nice and respectful toward each other because everyone belongs and everyone does belong in our schools? And one of the things that I've done as a legislator, rather than again, pick on these kids is we've passed 10 of my bills to feed them, to get, prevent and eliminate school meal debt from ever happening in the first place and to eliminate school meal debt shaming. I want to make sure that every kid who goes to Virginia schools is actually welcomed because of who they are, not despite it. Now, last year in Virginia, it became the, the state became the 12th state to to ban the gay and trans panic defense. Can you explain how you introduced this bill and, and where the sure. idea came from? Yeah, well, the idea came from one of my Manassas Park student constituents. Um, he was a high school student and he sent me an email uh, the prior summer saying, hey, you know, look, as an out student, I want to feel safe in the community here. What can you do to, you know, get this idea passed to ban the LGBTQ panic defense so that people like me don't get attacked or killed for just existing? And when I was a news reporter for 10 and a half years, there was a time where in a six month period, I covered two gruesome murders of black trans women in Montgomery County in Maryland. I never want anyone to feel that they should ever be assaulted because of who they are. Bill at this point says that you can't get someone's sentence either lessened or dismissed because the person they hurt or killed happened to be LGBTQ. You've had so many different experiences and so many different roles. You were in a heavy metal band, you're a stepmom, as we mentioned, and, and you were a reporter as well. How did you find this role in politics? Well, in politics, you know, so I spent 
all my journalism career covering politics to begin with. George W. Bush at the time as president not only was sending my family and friends, uh, you know, and classmates off to go fight a war in Iraq along with one in Afghanistan, but at the same time back home, he was proposing a constitutional amendment to ban marriage equality. I wanted to understand everything about politics at that point to understand why it's possible for something like that to even be put on the table and what mechanisms had to, you know, also be in place in order to prevent that from happening to the United state's constitution and we saw state after state after state that started banning marriage equality after that just like we're seeing today you know 18 years later it's the same discriminatory playbook that we're seeing from governors and we're seeing from state legislators attacking their own constituents instead of serving them and the thing is what we've learned from the marriage equality fight is even if it's a long road we will win and we will not let hate win ever. Delegate Rome, thank you so much for your time and for stopping by and for this conversation. Really appreciate it and congrats on the book. Thank you so much, Steffi. I'm so grateful to be here. And still to come, meet the teen who was accepted into 72 colleges. That's right, 72. We'll be right back. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. It is that time of year. High school seniors who plan to further their education are choosing where they'll go to college. For some, it's a really tough choice, but for one student in Florida who was accepted into more than 70 colleges, it might be downright impossible. Angela Rosier from our partner station, WPVF, introduces us to this incredible teen in the local lowdown. I'm so overwhelmed, I'm running. I haven't even got a chance to sit and realize how amazing this is. Like most high school seniors who are getting ready for college, Delia Thornton is excited, but she's not like most high school seniors. Just asked the Director of Counseling Services here at Glade Central High School. She showed me spreadsheets. It, it's unbelievable. I, I, she's, she's applied to so many colleges and got it accepted to so many. I've never seen anybody in all the years that I've been doing this. I was in New York and then Florida, n not even close. Thornton applied to 90 colleges and so far 72 have said yes. At Howard University, Spelman College, um, Xavier University of Louisiana, Tuskegee. She's applied all over and so she's willing to take risks and a lot of people are afraid to take risks and she's not. So I really applaud her. University of Florida, University of Miami, University of South Florida, mostly all the schools in Florida. Thornton tells me she's a psychology pre-med major with a minor in chemistry. And in the fall, she plans to attend Xavier University of Louisiana. But for now, she's still working on her valedictorian speech, and she credits her family, both at home and here at school, for helping her achieve her goals. First, I have to thank God because for him, none of this would be possible. But definitely my family, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandma, my aunties, my cousins, everybody. Um, and definitely my school family, but definitely my family. 
it's good to have options. She's got plenty of options. Congrats and best of luck to you in Louisiana. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news.